Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'd like to welcome you to the second installment of our American Art Up Close lecture series. The series is sponsored by the Terra Foundation for American Art, and I'd like to heartily thank the Terra for their gener generous, generous and continued support of this program. Um, the American Art Up Close lectures are an opportunity for us to um, engage with our permanent collection and to connect these objects with uh, areas, topics, topics of research and areas, um, areas of study among American art scholars. And uh, I'd like to alert you to two upcoming uh, sessions in our series. The next will be on April 30th. Patricia Junker of the Seattle Art Museum will lecture on Child Hassam, his flag paintings, and Theodore Roosevelt. And on May 7th, uh, the chair of our department, Judith Barter, will lecture on Trump Loy painting and modernity. And those are both Thursday nights, and we will convene here in Fullerton Hall. Tonight, I think we're in, a real, we're in for a real treat of the senses. Uh, Dr. Anna O'Marley is Curator of Historical American Art at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. And her lecture tonight is The Artist's Garden, American Impressionism, and the Garden Movement. This is the subject of Dr. Marley's current exhibition in Philadelphia at the Pennsylvania Academy, which opened last month and runs through May 24th, before traveling to four additional venues. Unfortunately, none of those are in the Midwest, so we are quite fortunate to have Anna Marley here tonight to, um, to discuss the story of American Impressionists and uh, artists who are working in painting, and stained glass, sculpture, book design, um, whose work took inspiration from and contributed to the burgeoning middle class garden movement at the turn of the 20th century. It's a national movement, but it has strong roots in Philadelphia. A painting from the Art Institute's collection, A City Park by William Merritt Chase, is part of the show. It's on loan in Philadelphia right now. And Dr. Marley will help us see this painting anew within the context of the period's avid taste for gardening. Anna Marley is a scholar of American art and material culture from the colonial era to 1945. She holds a PhD in art history from the University of Delaware and an MA in art history and museum studies from the University of Southern California. Since 2009, she has been curator of historical American art at the Pennsylvania Academy, where she has curated numerous exhibitions, including her current show, The Artist's Garden, as well as Spiritual Strivings, a celebration of African-American works on paper from 2014, A Mine of Beauty, Landscapes by William Trost Richards in 2012, Henry Oswa Tanner, Modern Spirit, also in 2012, and Anatomy Academy in 2011. Her future exhibitions concern the photography of Thomas Aikens, as well as 19th century history painting in the Americas. Dr. Marley has numerous publications. Uh, most recently, it's the exhibition catalog for the Artist's Garden, for which she is the editor and co-author. She also has authored an essay entitled Landscapes of the New Republic at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello in the book Building the British Atlantic World, which is forthcoming from the University of North Carolina Press. Dr. Marley currently serves as the chair of the Association of Historians of American Art, and I've had the distinct pleasure of working with Anna uh, on the board of this organization. Please join me in welcoming Anna Marley to the Art Institute of Chicago. Thank you all so much for coming tonight, and I promise to indeed reward your senses and give us all a nice warm breath of spring, which we so desperately need. I don't know if it's has been as bad in Chicago as it's been in Philadelphia this year, it's been pretty bad. 
So um, uh, before I start, I want to thank the Terra Foundation for uh, sponsoring this lecture series and helping to bring me here to Chicago. Uh, the Terra Foundation has done so much for American art, and it's so wonderful that they're here in Chicago. They um, helped sponsor my previous exhibition, Henry Oswood Tanner, Modern Spirit, and I was happy to visit one of his paintings here at Chicago. It was great to see my old friend in, in his galleries. I'd also like to thank the Department of American Art for inviting me and for being so hospitable, as well as for lending generously uh, the beautiful um, uh, William Merritt Chase painting that I'm showing you here. Uh, it is due to the, the generosity of colleagues um, such as, as the professionals here at Chicago that make exhibitions like this possible. I've been working on this exhibition for over three years and it really makes my job um, a joy when I have colleagues um, like Annalisa here at Chicago. So without further ado, let's get started. In 1907, the landscape architect Beatrix Ferrand wrote in her essay, The Garden is Picture, that the two arts of painting and garden design are closely related, except that the landscape paint gardener paints with actual color, line, and perspective to make a composition, as the maker of stained glass does, while the painter has but a flat surface on which to create his illusion. The painter has another great advantage over the gardener because as he cannot possibly transfer to canvas the millions of colors and shadows which make up the most ordinary landscape, he must eliminate so many. While painters might well disagree with Ferrand's assessment of their advantage over gardeners, those artists include, included in the exhibition The Artist's Garden would concur with her pairing of the art of painting and garden design. Descended from generations of gardeners that made up the Cadwallader family of Philadelphia, Ferrand, like many of the artists and gardeners included in the exhibition and the publication I uh, co-authored, it was never more than a few degrees separated from the fertile gardening and arts community that is Philadelphia. I open with Ferrand's words as they bring together many of the seemingly disparate elements of this exhibition. Garden writing, impressionist painting, the importance of light and movement, as expressed in the exhibition in oil paintings, watercolors, autochromes, stained glass, garden magazines, and books. The Artist Garden exhibition tells the intertwining stories of American artists, impressionism, and the growing popularity of gardening as a middle class leisure pursuit at the turn of the 20th century. No previous exhibition or publication on American Impressionism has looked at the gardens, artists, suburbs, and exhibitions of the greater Philadelphia area and their important generative role in a national movement. The publication and exhibition examine how the horticultural and visual arts in Philadelphia were artistic and environmental manifestations of an emerging national progressive era middle class American identity. Ferrand's statement above demonstrates the intertwining of the seemingly disparate elements of American Impressionist painting and turn of the century gardening practice. Now a lot of people ask me how I turned to this subject matter and I thought I would show you some pictures of my own garden. Um, a few years ago I was able to purchase a small um, little Tudor style house um, with a postage stamp garden in a suburb of Philadelphia, Mount Airy, one of the original, original uh, railroad suburbs. And um, I have just about, you know, it's about five by 10 feet, but I've packed it, jam-packed with flowers, and I started researching uh, the development of these suburbs, and I knew that um, I was interested in bringing together American Impressionism and the creation of these suburban uh, developments. And so as I started to do research, the, um, the exhibition came into focus. 
And the period of focus that I, fo I looked at uh, in this exhibition is the Progressive Era from the 1890s to 1920. One recognized of intense political, social, and artistic change in the United States. The decades that the exhibition covers saw an upsurge in nationalist feeling inspired by the afterlife of the Centennial Exhibition in 1876, anxieties about mass European immigration, agitation for universal women's suffrage, the advent of World War I and concomitant war gardens, the emergence of a robust middle class eager to make their mark on the American landscape, and the arrival of French Impressionist painting and principles in American galleries and studios. The garden movement in the United States was a product of an impetus for these changes. This movement was dr driven by American suburban lifestyles at the turn of the century that were linked to the development of railroad suburbs an interest in garden cities and public parks. And I'm showing you here uh, two of the uh, most popular public parks, um, a city park in Brooklyn, painted by William Merritt Chase, and Prendergast's painting of Boston Public Gardens. So even though I chose to focus on Philadelphia, uh, cities like uh, Boston, New York, and Chicago were all very much involved in the City Beautiful movement. We were the, the movements were also very much influenced by the British arts and crafts movement. And as I was looking through your galleries today, I noticed some beautiful uh, arts and crafts pottery in the American galleries. And that was definitely a part of this whole uh, movement. Born in the nostalgic era of the colonial revival, the garden movement represents a national and middle class enthusiasm for cultivating gardens that were seen as distinctly American. Held in Philadelphia in 1876, the Centennial Exhibition introduced the colonial revival movement, and thus a new wave of interest in American gardens. The colonial revival was a nationalistic movement that sought to revive elements of architectural style, garden design, and interior design of American colonial architecture. And I'm showing you here the Connecticut Pavilion of the Centennial Exhibition in 1876. And this movement definitely gained momentum in the 1890s and early part of the 20th century. Through the values of the progressive era, including the rise of a strong middle class and the definition of an American national identity, a middle class gardening community emerged. Intensely pruned gardens tended by hired hands, such as were seen on the estates of the robber barons of the country, were rejected in favor of the commuter's garden. Personal plots of amateur gardens filled with native and wild flowers. The American gardens depicted in Impressionist painting in the United States in this period were for the most part not the grand estate gardens of the wealthy, but those of an aspiring middle class, of which artists were often members. In an article published in the Garden Magazine in 1915, B.Y. Morrison addresses this audience, saying, quote, this article is not for the people who leave their gardens to the care of the hired man. The owner must belong to that demented clan who go out before breakfast to see the new peony buds and who come in from the office by way of the garden to see what the sun opened during the day. In the very popular 1901 publication, The Garden of a Commuter's Wife, the author, who lived in Fairfield, Connecticut, critiques her neighbor's showy Italian garden and describes her own as a purely American garden. In The Commuter's Wife Lament, there is both a race and class component, as the Italian or French garden of the time was associated with either the garden estates of the Gilded Age elite or perhaps recent Italian immigrants, whereas the American or colonial garden was deemed both patriotic and appropriate for this new middle class of suburban commuters. This quote reveals that not all progressive ideals that found their way into the garden were positive. Disturbed by the growth of immigrant communities eager for work in the cities, the middle class began an exodus to the suburbs, where new neighborhoods in the country provided space for individual amateur gardening. 
Further, anxiety over the country's changing demographics through immigration also prompted an interest in nativism. Native breeds of birds or flowers were celebrated for their genesis on American soil. A burgeoning environmental awareness also brought attention to these species. Members of the Audubon movement brought their conservationist principles into the garden and social life. And these concerns were manifested in the garden of Celia Thaxter, as well as Child Hassam. Now, Child Hassam worked with Thaxter and created the images for her book, An Island Garden, which was incredibly popular. She was also one of the founding members of the Audubon movement, which protested the decimation of native bird species. Impressionist artists in particular were invoked by garden aficionados in period magazines where the connection was explicit between contemporary American gardens and their painterly movement. Quote, the color scheme had been carefully planned last winter and it is cheerfully disregarded now as some new inspiration strikes us, such as a border of purple asters against salvia and white dahlias behind a strip of daring fall color, which would delight the soul of Gary Melkers, which delighted me, but which my wife said was horrible. And I'm showing you here two Gary Melkers canvases that are in the show so you can see the kind of um, daring color that the author is talking about. Thus the garden movement was not only carried out in garden plots, American artists, painters, sculptors, stained glass designers, and more contributed to this world through the production of works on garden, paper, and glass. The increasing professionalization of art making in the United States meant that artists too were members of this group. Many of the artists uh, that I'm examining today traveled to Europe, especially France, where they were exposed to the modernist style of Impressionism. And uh, I was able to walk through your European Impressionism galleries today. And so imagine all of these artists learning about Monet uh, for the first time and starting to travel to Giverny to see his garden. Lingering in the French countryside and the public parks of Paris, they experimented with Impressionist principles of plein air painting, the study of light with direct unmediated compositions, and the application of unmodulated color in quick brush strokes. The first exhibition of French Impressionist art in the United States opened at the Durand Ruel Gallery in New York in 1886. In the United States, as in Europe, the concerns and techniques of Impressionism made the outdoor garden a natural, perennially inspiring subject. By 1887, American artists, such as John Leslie Breck, shown here, were traveling to Claude Monet's famous garden at Giverny to study with the master impressionist. And this is uh, also a Chicago picture. It belongs to the Terra Foundation. Whether or not American artists wholly subscribe stylistically to European impressionism, they were forced to grapple with the sea change it brought to modern art and culture. While artists like Breck, Friesecke and Theodor Robinson cast themselves in the stylistic mode of Impressionists. And I'm thinking here, uh, especially of Robinson, looks very much like some of the Pizarros upstairs. Other painters like Henry Breckenridge, Mariah Oki Dewing, and Child Hassam filtered its principles through their own vision to create a distinctive style. For example, in the case of Dewing, she, her painterly style cannot be described as impressionist, but her insistence on the study and painting of flowers en plein air was a product of the impact of French Impressionism on American painters. Even outside the art world, the language of Impressionism permeated American society, informing how people talked about the speed of modern life, the cadence of their poetry, and the spectacle of their gardens. Even a traditionally academic painter like Anna Lee Merritt espoused an impressionist aesthetic when it came to her description of gardening in her book, An Artist's Garden, published in 1908. Like Merritt, many artists wrote about gardens and numerous articles from the period document what artists thought about how to paint flowers, but also why it was considered valuable to paint in the garden. Jane Peterson published an article in the Garden Magazine in September 1922 about her great and absorbing passion for flowers. 
Around 1910, she began painting in Lewis Comfort Tiffany's garden in Long Island. And between then and 1914, she produced a series of great garden pictures. Peterson explained her interest in flowers for reasons formal, scientific, and sentimental. She loved painting flowers for, quote, their prismatic hues of the rainbow, and because they were, quote, all that is delicate, all that is lurid, brilliant, bizarre. She wrote of their structure and decorative quality, saying that, as a designer, I have conventionalized them and used them for patterns, and also their individuality by painting them, quote, realistically in bunches, paying careful attention to the characteristics of each specimen. She concludes her essay with the statement, I adore gardens. They are the most elusive art of a nation. Peterson's painting Spring Bouquet incorporates all of these elements. The color palette she uses is brilliant and almost lurid, especially in the orange of the poppies, which are echoed in the bright orange of the woman's headdress. The steep, tilted perspective of post-impressionism and the inherent sense of pattern in the composition of the background are complemented by a foreground of individual specimens which can, which can be identified by Janus, such as bearded iris, lilies, and poppies. The flowers she chooses are fashionable, as the up-to-date gown and headdress that she wears. In fact, it was the dress and hat that she's wearing that enabled me to date this painting. Previously, it had been undated in the PAFA collection. She shows her central figure reaching out to touch the flowers in the garden. This imparts a sense of tactility of the flowers to the viewer, and it may also be a gesture of rebellion on Peterson's part, for she wrote that her mother had always forbade her to touch flowers in the garden. The National Garden Movement, and in particular artists' interest in gardens, has deep roots in Philadelphia. Almost every artist included in this exhibition taught, studied, or exhibited at PAFA during their lifetimes. Additionally, many of these artists were keenly involved in the horticultural arts. Philadelphia was a national leader in the garden movement, and the city has a long and distinguished gardening history. From the city's founding as William Penn's green and pleasant town in the 17th century, to the establishment of John Bartram's botanical gardens in 1728, to Charles Wilson Peale's retirement to and cultivation of his garden at Belfield in the early 19th century, right up until the period that is the focus of my book. The Pennsylvania Horticultural Society was founded in 1827, and two years later had its first flower show, which continues to this day. In her popular 1901 colonial revival-inspired publication, Old Time Gardens, Alice Morse Earl wrote of Philadelphia, there floriculture reached by the time of the revolution a very high point, and many exquisite gardens bore ample testimony to the pride of life, as well as the taste and, and love of flowers of Philadelphia friends. In fact, colonial gardens of Philadelphia became even more popular and celebrated in the decades after the centennial. The period of focus for the exhibition was a particularly fecund period for floriculture in Philadelphia. The Morris family began work on their garden uh, in 1887, which is now the University of Pennsylvania's Morris Arboretum. Already a center of publishing in the United States, at the turn of the century, the city became a center of horticultural publishing. The influential House and Garden magazine was founded in Philadelphia in 1901. Prompting and responding to this changing taste in gardening was a proliferation of horticultural publications that were celebratory and instructive by turn. The Garden Club of Philadelphia was founded in 1904 in the gardens of Andalusia. In 1910, the Pennsylvania School of Horticulture for Women was founded in what is now Temple University, and the Garden Club of America was founded in the gardens at Stenton in Germantown in 1913. And not to forget Chicago, um, one of the founding clubs was the Lake Forest Garden Club, and they were actually at the 1913 meeting in the garden at Stenton, which I'm showing you here. And uh, this national club uh, had the mission to, quote, stimulate the knowledge and love of gardening among amateurs 
to share the advantages of association through conference and correspondence in the country and abroad, to aid in the protection of native plants and birds, and to encourage civic planting. I am always impressed when I read that uh, description because it sounds so modern and so engaged with many things that we struggle with living in cities today. The founding of these garden clubs, centers of education, and publications was embedded within the Progressive Era's intense social activism and political reform. Horticultural obsession also permeated the Philadelphia art scene. One can see it in PAFA's annual exhibition design. And what I'm showing you here is one of our exhibitions from 1907. And this is my exhibition design for the show. And so that's why I encourage you to all come to Philadelphia, because this is the first time I've become a curator of plants and flowers. It's been very challenging. I don't know if I'll do it again, but I definitely uh, enjoyed putting this together. One of the most iconic conjunctions of art in the garden is, is the commissioning from Maxfield Parish of Tiffany Studios' fabulous Dream Garden in the Curtis Building. The work was commissioned by Edward Bach, the head of Curtis Publishing, um, the influential publisher of Ladies Home Journal for the company's new headquarters. The Dream Garden embodies many of the central stories of the exhibition and publication. The mural was made by two artists whose gardens were of central importance to their oeuvre. Maxfield Parish's home in the Cornish colony, famous for its gardens, was an inspiration for the mural. And Tiffany's garden at his estate in Long Island was not only an inspiration for his stained glass, but for other artists as well. And I can't help but feel really lucky that I'm standing here underneath th this great piece by Tiffany and uh, showing you one of the Tiffany stained glass pieces that is in the exhibition. The show explores various aspects of one might, what one might call the horticultural impulse in American Impressionist art. From the gardens of artists to the magazines that celebrated and influenced them, from the emergence of the modern conservation movement and debates about immigration, to new technologies of mass reproduction and emerging fields of landscape architecture. The art in the show consists of gardens urban and suburban, real and ideal. And central to the exhibition is the role of American artists in turn of the century gardening culture and progressive era concerns. In her 1908 book, An Artist Garden Tended, Painted, Described, Anna Lee Merritt, a Philadelphia native uh, who moved to Great Britain, wrote, an artist's interest in gardening is to produce pictures without brushes, and I have resorted to weary painting only to show the effect of groups and arrangements that gratify me. Like Merritt, Many of her contemporary artists worked to create pictures without brushes in their own gardens and produced some of the most exciting and understudied examples of turn of the century garden painting and photography. In gardens from Florida to New Hampshire and across the Atlantic to the United Kingdom, these artists nurtured uh, artistic communities, cultivated American flowers, and experimented with color and form. They exhibited at prestigious venues across the United States, including the Art Institute, and disseminated their writings about and photography of their gardens in many national publications devoted to home and garden that mushroomed in the first decades of the 20th century. So in the time that remains tonight, I'm going to talk about some of these specific gardens, physical, artistic, and literary, I will explore how the companion arts of gardening and painting, and to a lesser degree photography, resulted in works of art that are intimate, personal, and complex, intimately linked to the socio-historic concerns of the progressive era garden movement. For the artists discussed today, the garden was a domestic space but also a space of inspiration and technical experimentation. They wrote about gardens, painted them, and lived in them. Through their treatments of the garden, we see how expansive the definition of American Impressionism can be. From the flower portraits of Mariah Oki Dewing, to the women as flowers by Charles Curran and Lillian Westcott Hale, and the wildflower sketches of John Twachtman. The artists included in the exhibition are unanimous in their interest in the garden as part of their artistic practice. 
but with very different results. I do not argue that all of these artists were Impressionists, but I do assert that the Impressionist movement, along with the emerging middle class identities bound up in the retreat from the city, was crucial to how these artists conceived of and executed their artistic practice. The lives of two period authors, one an artist gardener, the other a landscape architect, demonstrate the conflicted nature of American Impressionism when it comes to garden imagery and literature of the period. The first, Anna Lee Merritt, who I mentioned uh, was born in Philadelphia and studied there until she moved to England and married uh, artists and gave up painting for the most part. She gave it up for gardening and was a very popular gardening authority amongst her contemporaries. She wrote that her intention in publishing An Artist's Garden was to impart her delight, quote, in the cult of arranging pictures to bloom in living colors and vary as swiftly as the cinematograph, invoking the newly created medium of film with painting and gardening. She also wrote that, quote, I have not acquired the latest Impressionist style, which so ably represents things as seen from a motor car at full speed. She seems to have an, a very ambivalent attitude towards technology and modernity, as well as Impressionism. In, is her garden a retreat or a celebration? On the one hand, she compares her garden to the cinema, but on the other, she critiques Impressionism as a view from a speeding car. In her painting technique, she was decidedly academic, yet she chose to have her book illustrated with the modern reproductive technology of the chromolithograph, which I am showing you here, and her prose is decidedly impressionistic. The landscape architect Beatrix Ferrand was similarly critical of the speed of modern life. And just a note about Ferrand, she is one of a handful of women landscape architects that come into prominence at this period. And just as professional artists, uh, women artists are being able to make a career in this period, so are women uh, select few in the field of landscape architecture. In discussing the garden as experienced by the 18th century artist traveler in comparison with the American traveling abroad in the early 20th century, Ferrand states that, <clears throat> quote, artists were not distracted by the multitude of photographs and rapid mental impressions of travel, which with us makes individuality so difficult to keep. Both Merritt and Ferrand seem to use the term impression and impressionist as a shorthand for speed and lack of focus, rather than a positive, spontaneous style of capturing nature. But later in the same essay, Ferrand argues that, quote, a garden, large or small, must be treated in the impressionist manner. And that, quote, one of the most important things the impressionist school has been trying to teach is that shadow is a color and must be used as one. And the reason why the eye seeks relief from a flat surface is not only that it instinctively resents monotony, but that it feels the need of shadow. What are we to make of these often contrary invocations of Impressionism? What they do seem to reveal is that the overwhelming presence and influence of Impressionist techniques and modes of vision, but also a reluctance by Americans to wholeheartedly embrace the aesthetic. Many of the artists included in the exhibition had complicated relationships with Impressionism. Artists such as Twachman and Thomas Wilmer Dewing might be more correctly described as tonalists. And though Henry Breckenridge and Philip Leslie Hale experimented with Impressionism, they also dabbled in abstraction and academic painting. Can a photographer like Thomas Shields Clark or an illustrator like Violet Oakley be described as Impressionist? Rather than stylistic similarities, what unites these artists is their deep artistic engagement with their gardens and their obsessive repetition of certain themes, flowers, and compositions. Many of these artists were commuters who taught in the city but also lived on the lines of suburban train or trolley car suburbs, including Breckenridge and Oakley in Philadelphia, Twachtman in New York City, and the Hales in suburban Boston. The artists were exactly the class of educated urban professionals that were the audience for the mushrooming garden publication industry and culture. 
Much as our current obsession with the lives of celebrities can be deduced from looking at the covers of magazines in the airport, a perusal of the emergent forms of home and garden magazines at the turn of the 20th century reveal the interconnectedness of American artists and their gardens, as well as the public taste and knowledge of these gardens. Living in suburban railroad suburbs, artist colonies or rural retreats, artists were some of the most recognizable members of this newly emergent class. On the gardens of, Cornish, of the Cornish art colony, and of which these paintings are too, Francis Duncan, Duncan wrote in 1906, a garden is not sacred. It is simply an outgrowth of the house, an out of door living room to be used and changed if one pleases. Perhaps the intimacy of gardens and owners is due to the fact that no Cornish garden is given over to the care of a hireling. The idea that gardens are not the work of the hired man, but of an individual homeowner, perhaps the artist himself, is key in much of the garden literature of the period. American Impressionist artists and their peers were minor celebrities of this group, and their gardens and lifestyles were featured in publications of the period, much as the home of film stars might be featured in Architectural Digest today. John Henry Twachtman, perhaps the artist in the exhibition most associated with suburban retreat, and you have some wonderful Twachtmans here uh, of his estate that you can see in your galleries, um, had traveled to Europe and studied at the Académie Julien in Paris before returning to the United States and um, teaching at the New York Art Student League in 1889. He bought a small house on 17 acres in Connecticut outside Greenwich that he named Willowbrook. During the 1890s, he turned again and again to the house, its gardens and brook, flowers and family as subject for his paintings. Twachman's garden was a popular destination for his fellow artists. And I'm showing you here a photograph of his uh, garden from um, a magazine published in the period. The 1895 art amateur wrote, Mr. Twachman's country place seems to be a regular rendezvous for Impressionists. It has already been painted by several. On a May 1894 vid visit to Greenwich, Theodore Robinson wrote, the country fresh and lovely, Twachman as usual, making a trellis or porch for vines. One can see these trellises and vines in his paintings of his home. Even after his death in 1902, his garden continued to be a pilgrimage spot of sorts and was the subject of a 1905 article in Country Life. And this is the Im one of the images from that article, which stated that the artist throughout his Greenwich years returned to the same subject, never tiring of painting views of his house from the back and front, his garden and surrounding landscape. Twachtman's preoccupation with his garden can be seen not only in the care he took in designing his house, but in the myriad painted sketches he did of perennial and native flowers in his garden. In Meadow Flowers from 1892, the artist takes a worm's eye view of wild native plants growing on his property. His field of vision is surrounded by plants which blow in the breeze and move on the canvas. Considered a weed by some, goldenrod was beloved by others. In an 1894 edition of The Wildflowers of America, the author stated, quote, we in this country have a great love of the goldenrods. Although they are few species in Europe and in other parts of the world, the Janus solidago reaches its highest development in North America. Twachman's treatment of the flower differs greatly, however, from Charles Curran's goldenrod of 1916. Both Curran and Twachman faithfully represent the plant, but Curran uses the flower to echo the graceful pose of his female standing figure and reveal his formal interest in the similarity of garden and female forms. Curran wrote, quote, one of the pleasantest ways to paint flowers out of doors is in combination with figures, particularly women and children. Colors are echoed in many-hued reflection in women's faces, so that they seem to be as much a flower as the flower themselves. Twachman's painting of his garden are experiential and lived in, whereas Curran's uh, flower and women painting are about form and composition. 
For example, in this 1897 painting on the terrace, Twachman's wife and children sit looking towards the sunset in a high summer day. A golden pink glow can be seen kissing the top of the roof of the house in the background, and in the foreground, lilies are in full bloom. White lilies re release their scent at night, so it was common practice for people to pull their chairs and sit by fragrant lilies as the sun went down. One can imagine that this was part of a daily ritual for the Twachtmans, to sit on their porch that the artist had built and drink in the scent of the flowers that he and his family took care of. Twachman's garden was not only a place for detailed study of plants, but a place of recovery and retreat. <clears throat> In a letter to his friend J. Alden Weir of December 16, 1891, Twachman wrote, I feel more and more contented with the isolation of country life. It is necessary to live always in the country at all seasons of the year. Like Anna, Anna Lee Merritt and many other uh, middle-class Americans, Twachman saw his garden as a retreat from the bustle of the city. In this way, both Twachman and Merritt were unlike many of the French Impressionists whose garden paintings celebrated the fleeting moment, momentariness of modern life in Paris and its suburbs. As art historian Kathleen Pine has shown, interest in mind cures and the therapeutic nature of the garden was a particular part of American Impressionists' interest in depictions of the garden. A 1910 article in Country Life proselytized this gospel. Quote, housebound women, office enslaved men, tired, nervous, world-weary people, compelled at last to make nature their soul. In the soil, one must dig to discover the great elixir or playfellow, finding in gardening health for body and life." End quote. In particular, it seems to be the garden in winter that is most associated with this idea of renewal escape from the city. For instance, Helena Ely's 1916 publication, The Practical Flower Garden, begins in the late winter with a chapter uh, that writes of a visit of the winter town dweller to the near country, where in mid-March he sees life emerging out of the melting snow. And the town dweller returns, quote, to the noisy city of of brick and stone possessed by the longing that spring calls forth to be at work among the growing things and to watch nature as she comes to life again. I think we can all relate to that right now. Anna Lee Merritt structures her book on her garden by the seasons and starts with a garden in midwinter and ends with goodbye summer. As she describes her garden in winter, she could be describing a winter scene by John Twachtman. And I quote, it is the end of December. The little village nestles in a narrow valley between great downs. All life is at ebb. A few days ago, the whole earth was clothed in shimmering white, radiating a light of its own, until about noon, low down near the horizon, the pearly veil of the sky's gray face was breathed aside, and a saffron gleam, like the flash in an opal, shot across the snow and into our hearts, where we called it hope. She writes of the need for rest, of the long twilight of min midwinter days, of repose in eternity. One might be tempted to ask whether her book is really a book on gardening. It is, but it is a publication, as, uh, as in others of the period of the garden, um, as a metaphor for all sorts of things. It's a place to deal with anxieties, a place to escape the world. Similarly, Twachtman said, we must have snow and lots of it. Never is nature more lovely than when it is snowing. Everything is so quiet and the whole earth seems wrapped in a mantle. The feeling of quiet and all nature hushed to silence. Well, for some artists, the garden was this space of retreat. For others, it was a site of technical innovation. This was particularly the case for Mariah Oki Dewing, Thomas Shields Clark, and Henry Breckenridge, who we're all going to look at. Mariah Oki Dewing first studied at the Cooper Union School of Design and then studied with John Lafarge, 
and then went on to help found the New York Art Students League. She was a famous author as well as a painter, and after her marriage to Thomas Wilmer Dewing in 1881, her reputation was somewhat eclipsed by her husband. However, a study of her gardening and painting practice in the Dewing home in Doveridge, uh, Doveridge in Cornish, New Hampshire, where the Dewings spent their summers, makes it clear that her artistic practice was channeled into her innovative flower paintings. Oki Dewing, subscribing to the current middle class vogue for gardening, did the majority of the work in the garden herself, an intimate relationship that made her flower paintings so unique. In a 1915 article entitled, Flower Painters and What the Flower Offers to Art, Dewing writes beautifully of the intense study required for a successful flower painter, and that one must, quote, bind themselves in a long apprenticeship to the garden. In her prose and painting, Dewing sees flowers in detail, close up, with the background blurred. In Rose Garden from 1901, morning glories make an appearance, letting us know the time of day as the these flowers only bloom in the morning before the sun gets high in the sky. The roses are modern hybrid perpetual roses, and they fill the entirety of the horizontal canvas. Dewing's long acquaintance with the flowers in her Cornish garden bore fruit in her worm's eye view of iris, roses, and poppies. Indeed, the art critic Royal Cortezos wrote of her flower paintings that she painted, quote, literally their portraits. This reference to portraiture is interesting, as late in life, Oki Dewing mourned the fact that she had given up large figure in landscape painting to paint flowers. Perhaps this accounts for the uniqueness of these paintings. They're not still lives, but portraits, and ambitious, full-scale ones at that. They take on the format of horizontal landscape paintings, rather than the, the traditional smaller scale of still lives. Like Oki Dewing, the artist Thomas Shield Clark came from a wealthy background and studied abroad before coming back to the United States. In 1902, he hired Philadelphia architect Wilson Eyre, who had also designed Stephen Parrish's house in Cornish, to design Fernbrook, his arts and crafts style studio, house, in, and garden in Lenox, Massachusetts. The gardens were decorated with his sculpture, which you can see here on the left, and the setting for the fabulous series of autochromes that he produced before 1919. Now, autochromes were an expensive, cutting-edge glass plate photography process, which consisted of a glass plate coated on one side with a random mosaic of microscopic greens of potato starch dyed red, orange, green, and blue violet, which acted as color filters. Clark published a selection of these prints in an illustrated article, Color Studies of My Gardens for Country Life in 1919. These are beautifully articulated, composed, and highly finished works of art. Beginning around 1910, he produced hundreds of these autochromes, which only an artist uh, as wealthy as Clark could have afforded. The technology was extremely fugitive, and that explains why this technique was abandoned. Now, the color produced in these images was stunning, and a lot of people think that these are actually painted, like early photographs, but they're not. They were actually photographic color printed on the glass. Um, but unfortunately, if they are exposed to light for any length of time, the color disappears. That's why they're so rare. They were taken at all seasons in his garden, and they include landscapes, figure studies of models, Grecian costumes, still life saturated with lush color of cut flowers cut from his garden. In this uh, image here, women in modern white dresses are posed in the foreground across from a stand of white lilies. In the background, another young woman communes with one of Clark's garden sculptures, leaning forward in a mirror image of a sculpted winged victory. One might compare these images to Charles Curran's paintings of women in gardens, where he echoed and balanced the forms of flowers and women. But Clark also structured his color studies, particularly his still lives, in strikingly formal ways. He has a brilliant eye for structure and color contrast. In the work on the right, he sets up a still life out of doors. Um, 
uh, flowers tumble out of a bowl, tilting afternoon light f filters through an arrangement, a small Tanagra figure is isolated in the foreground. Clark also co arranged color still lives of people, which he wrote about in distinctly racial terms. One figure that stands out from all the young women and family members in his color studies, but which he chose to include in the publication Country Life, is the figure of a dark-skinned man in an Arab turban posed amongst a selection of pottery in shades of terracotta, orange, and blue. In his description of this autochrome, Clark links race and formal cl color arrangements. Speaking of a trip to Morocco, Clark, Clark wrote, the swarthy brown complexion of the Moors from Central Africa made wonderful contrast to the colors they wore. I brought some of these delightful co costumes intact and was later disappointed to find how much they lost in harmony when worn by persons of white skin. So again, you can see this undercurrent of race coming up in, in garden imagery in the time period. Another formal innovator in the garden was Breckenridge, who attended PAFA and taught there as well. In 1900, he opened the Darby School with his, Tom, his uh, colleague Thomas Anschutz. The school began in Valley Forge and then moved to center on his home, Floxdale, in Fort Washington, which I'm showing you here. It was in this garden that cre he created his best Impressionist paintings and taught many of his students. An article in the Ambler Gazette from 1909 described the school as a place where, quote, students get close to nature in humble settings, a drab little building like a backwoodsman's dwelling. The studio is ideally located at the foot of a sloping meadow set back on Bethlehem Pike. It has a background of thick woods, such as Impressionists love to paint in vivid dabs of color, and is approached from the road by a whimsical twisting path. Breckenridge was a connoisseur of flocks. His photographs of garden, in his photograph his, his, of his garden, Phlox paniculata can be seen growing in abundance. The plant is also the primary subject matter of some of his best Impressionist paintings, including white phlox, which belongs to the Terra Foundation. While Breckenridge is clearly interested in the specific genus of flower he's depicting, he even named his house after them, he's not doing portraits of them in the way Oki Doing did. His primary interest here seems to be in color and how color vibrates under the effect of the sun. In white flocks, the foreground is entirely composed of vivid pink and white flocks, cutting off the view of the path to, uh, behind the blossoms. There is no human figure here, none of the many students that populate his photographs. And yet the paintings do suggest a human presence through the inclusion of paths and, in, in, and gates and walls. For another group of path artists, Violet Oakley, Elizabeth Shippen Green, and Jesse Wilcox Smith, the garden was subject matter, artistic metaphor, and generative space. These three artists adopted the group name the Red Rose Girls, and so garden metaphors were tightly bound up in their professional and group identity. The three artists met at PAFA and decided to combine forces and live together, supporting and nurturing each other's artistic careers. In their illustrations for popular magazines, including In the Garden and Rosebuds, women and children were often set in a background of garden imagery. In photographs of the three women illustrators in their Chestnut Street studio, their companion, Henrietta Cousins, is poised above them, watering can aloft the artists in their telltale smocks, each holding a rose. In another photograph, Jesse Wilcox Smith and Elizabeth Shippen Green pose in the enclosed garden at Cogsley, the site of their second group home in Mount Airy, just a few blocks away from me. Henrietta Cousins was not a visual artist, but it was she who maintained the gardens at Cogsley. And we can see from this playful photograph of her watering her roses, she was also the caretaker and nurturer of the professional Oakley, Shippen Green, and Wilcox Smith. Two final Impressionist painters that I want to consider from the perspective of gendered gardens are the married team of Lillian Westcott and Philip Leslie Hale. They were both natives of Boston who had studied abroad before they met each other. Um, and then in 1888, uh, 
Hale, um, Mr. Hale, that is, began spending his summers in Giverny and came under the sway of Impressionism, turning away from his academic training towards a light color palette and loose brushwork. In 1902, he married fellow artist Lillian Westcott, and they settled in the Dedham suburb of Boston, where Philip did a series of paintings of women in his garden, while Lillian focused on highly accomplished drawings set in an interior. Before they moved to Boston, he painted this painting, Top of the Morning. In the painting, a plant native to Rhode Island, Parthenicosis, trains its way up an arbor, echoing the vertical lines of the standing women. Whereas the two other paintings that I included in the exhibition by Hale show suburban Boston. In the Crimson Rambler, house, garden, and women become one. Vines, shrubs, and creepers were incredibly popular in the period and the rambler spreads over the inorganic form of the house. In an article, Lessons from English Cottage Gardens, the author Wilhelm Miller proposes that to develop an American style in cottage and suburban gardens, one, um, one must have cottages nearly covered with climbers. Hale is very specific about the variety of flowers that he includes in his paintings. They're not there for purely formal color, the Crimson Rambler, for instance, was imported from Japan, from Great Britain, into the United States in 1894. In this painting, Hale idealizes the Rambler much as he idealizes his woman in white. The bloom is considerably larger than it would actually have grown, but just as his woman is ideal, so is his plant. In the sun bath, the flowers are hollyhocks, and they echo the billowing white sheaths the women wear to bathe in the sun of their suburban backyard. Hale used photography as well to help him achieve the balance between figures and flowers. In all three of his, these paintings that I've shown you, Hale sets up a contrast between the forms of the women and the forms of the flowers. It's almost as if they are mirrors of each other. Philip Hale's brightly colored oil canvases of garden exteriors of his house stand in contrast to Lillian Westcott's depiction of interior landscapes. She excelled at charcoal drawing. During the period that her, painting, that her husband painted large oils in an outdoor setting, she completed a series of intimate portraits in charcoal of women and girls named for specific flowers, including Gardenia Rose and Black-Eyed Susan. These charcoals are among the most accomplished and sought after of her works. Rather than painting women mirrored by floral forms like her husband did, Westcott Hale seems to almost ironically draw women as flowers. And I say ironically in a very different way than artists like Curran because she titles the drawings after particular flowers, but they are in fact identified models, uh, women and girls that she was friends with and knew rather than women she hired. Whether the garden was a site of removal and retreat, a site of technical innovation, or a space of highly gendered artistic practice, the garden was an integral element of the artistry of painters, photographers, and illustrators I've discussed tonight. They're remarkably varied in their stylistic approach to the garden. Nevertheless, all these artists embody the diversity of artists associated with American Impressionism and the garden movement. And I do hope that if you enjoy uh, the artists you've learned about tonight, you come visit the exhibition at PAFA or at one of its many other touring venues, or you uh, purchase a catalog that's for sale at the back of the auditorium. And I thank you for coming this evening.